Hi guys, Ricky Pope here, and this week on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast, I talk with Dr. Frank Turek from Cross Examined about his newest book, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God, plus scripture and nerdy news, and we'll get to all of that right after this. 2022 is flying by so fast, and I just reviewed my goals for the year. It's not too late to set some effective goals for 2022 for yourself. And the Goal Process 101 ebook helps you do just that. With a straightforward process and practical exercises, you'll be guided to set the right goals for you and set out a plan to achieve them. Get your copy of the Goal Process 101 ebook. Um, by going to goalprocess101.com, use CNU2022 at checkout to save 10%. Now, back to the show. Let's get right into our scripture. And I thought I would read a scripture passage that Frank Turek references in his book, Hollywood Heroes. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. In the book, Frank references Captain America and Iron Man along with this passage, uh, as one uses a shield and the other has a set of full armor. Um, Obviously, these are not the same, but they're an interesting way to bring a conversation around to a spiritual idea when we're enjoying our nerdy fandoms. Speaking of our nerdy fandoms, let's do some nerdy news. Ezra Miller, who has played The Flash in multiple DC projects and the upcoming Flash movie that is slated to be released in a little less than a year, continues to make news and not in a good way. Some reports say that executives met as early as March of this year and decided to put a pause on Miller for the future of Warner Brothers projects for now, and others are speculating how they will handle the upcoming film, suggesting three options, either push ahead with all the plans and press and have Miller out front and center, Uh, release the film as planned but with limited press and publicity, or release the film directly to HBO Max. Without a significant change, it's likely that The Flash will be Miller's last film with Warner Brothers and DC. It is a multiverse movie. Could we see an end credit scene where The Flash arrives and is played by a whole new actor? We'll have to wait and see. In box office news, Top Gun Maverick, Tom Cruise's most recent film, has topped $1 billion in its global box office and over $500 million domestically. This is a first for any Tom Cruise movie and only the second film to achieve that success since the pandemic, Uh, the other film being Spider-Man No Way Home. Kevin Feige confirmed last week that Marvel will attend the San Diego Comic-Con this summer and will have a full panel in Hall H. 
This will be the first time in three years since Feige and Marvel have had the in-person panel and the first time in three years Comic-Con has happened in person. Marvel has never attended every year, and when they do, it is often full of great announcements. I can't wait to hear what news they have for us this year. A few weeks ago, I was able to sit down and chat with Dr. Frank Turek of crossexamined.org. If you're not familiar with Frank, he is a speaker, apologist, and award-winning author. Some books you might have heard of are Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God, Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Make Their Case, and I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. As the president of crossexamined.org, Frank presents powerful and entertaining evidence for Christianity and has also debated several prominent atheists, including Christopher Hitchens and David Silverman. In our interview, we talk about his newest book, Hollywood Heroes, and discuss some of the attributes the heroes of our fandoms have in common with Christ. Dr. Frank Turek, it is wonderful to have you on the Christian Nerds Unite podcast today. It's great being with you, Ricky. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So you have been doing apologetics for mm -hmm. many, many years, mm -hmm. and uh, your website, Cross Examined, is where probably most people know you from. But recently you wrote a book that um, is a little more on the nerd side. Uh, a book, <laughs> well, apologetics a, is nerdy too. I mean, we, it is. It you is. Know, you are. You are not wrong. Are normally, are thinkers, and you know that can correlate with with nerdiness, <laughs> like myself. So, yeah, absolutely. You are, mm -hmm. you are not wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but recently, you you wrote a book that had uh, more to do with. Uh, what maybe secular people think of nerds thinking of mm -hmm. uh you know superheroes and sci-fi and and fantasy things uh you wrote hollywood heroes and uh i have actually been reading the book absolutely love it oh good um, and uh, so so what made you decide that this was the right book right now well my son who is also a graduate of our seminary southern evangelical seminary here in charlotte that's where i went years ago he's in the air force as an air force officer but he's also gone to seminary online and he's a movie buff and we got talking this is probably five or so years ago we were talking about all the parallels to christianity you see in these superhero and fantasy movies and we mm -hmm. thought that would be a good book so it ultimately wound up as the book known now known as Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. And what we do is we go through uh, some major movie franchises, uh, Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Batman, and Wonder Woman. And we've got Superman in there and Spider-Man's in there a little bit as well. And we all po we point out how all these stories are borrowed, at least partially, from the greatest story ever told, mm -hmm. and how all these heroes particularly the heroes you see in these movies, are shadows of the ultimate hero. They're parallel to the ultimate hero, Jesus of Nazareth. So that's what the book is all about. It shows the parallels. It shows how we're enchanted when we see someone sacrifice for us. Mm. And that's what these superheroes do. They sacrifice for us to take us to a land of bliss. We all want to be taken out of this land of pain and suffering we want to be taken to a place of bliss. That's what superheroes do. And that's, of course, what Jesus himself does. Mm. Good word. Well, I, I know a lot of these stories, and you talk about a little bit about this in the book, mm -hmm. um, a lot of these stories turn into morality stories. Yeah, they and, all are. And, yeah. yeah. And why do you think that even though a lot of the writers and producers of these films and stories uh, maybe are, are not believers or they know a little about Christian faith, but they're, you know, they, it's not their thing. Um, why do you think they include things like this that could tie so closely to what we see as obviously a type and shadow of, of, uh, you know, what Jesus is? Well, they can't help it, Ricky, because they live in God's world like the rest of us do. Mm. And our deepest desire is to be taken from this world of pain and suffering. And to have someone come and do that for us is inspiring, particularly when someone comes and does that for us. And that person has to sacrifice for us. 
Uh, let me give you an example of this. Um, out of the seven movie franchises we look at in Hollywood Heroes, two of them were written by Christians. Mm. Uh, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, a devout mm. Catholic. And I know this is going to seem odd to some of your Christian listeners, but Harry Potter yes. is written by uh, an Anglican Christian, J.K. Rowling, who, maybe we can get into it later, pointed out that the Bible is really the inspiration for the whole thing. Okay. And I know Christians are like, oh, it's got magic and it's got divination in there. And so it can't be, we could talk about that later. <laughs> but the other franchises, to my knowledge, were not written by Christians. Yet, even uh, the folks that put together the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, particularly mm -hmm. those that wrote the movies leading up to Endgame, couldn't help but put in a Christian theme. In fact, Think about it this way. Tony Stark, right? And we're, there's going to be a lot of spoiler alerts here, friends. If you haven't <laughs> if you haven't seen Iron Man or Endgame yet, I'm oh, sorry. We're going to reveal the whole thing right here. I, we're, we're, we're past spoiler warnings on, okay, all right. on this. Just, we're, we're all all these are it. old enough. All these stories are old enough that uh -huh. if they haven't watched them yet, they've probably already been spoiled. So I'm not yeah, worried about right. it too much. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Darth Vader is the father of Luke Skywalker. What? <laughs> Who'd have known that anyway? <laughs> only so, 40 years, um, only 40 years. Yeah. Tony, <laughs> Tony Stark starts out as a billionaire playboy, amoral arms dealer, right? He's the last person mm -hmm. you'd expect to be a hero because it's all about him, right? Right. It's just about me, me, me. And by the way, he's miserable, right? He's, he's, he's got the big three. What are the big three we all think we want to be happy? We've got to have money. We've got to have power, recognition. And we gotta have, uh, we gotta have a great sexual relationship. Sex, money, power. Those are the big three things mm -hmm. that everybody thinks they want. And if I just had those three things, I'd be happy. Well, Tony Stark has it all, and he's miserable. He has everything to live with and nothing to live for, right? Mm -hmm. Now that, that's 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 like a lot of people in this world today. Exactly, exactly. And we're told. That in order to be happy and get those things, you got to follow your heart, right? You got to stream every every ocean, or you got to you got to swim every ocean, you got to climb every mountain, you got to do all that to to become happy and get those three mm -hmm. three basic things. Well, Tony Stark's been doing that, and he's miserable. Then there's an event that occurs in his life, as you know, one of his own weapons detonates near him because his company sold these weapons to terrorists. And uh, this weapon detonates near him and puts shrapnel in his chest, and he has to have this device installed in his chest to guard his heart from encroaching shrapnel. If that device fails, he dies. Now, I don't think the writers intended this, Ricky, but this is a beautiful <laughs> illustration of what I think is the second most important verse in the Bible to this generation mm -hmm. today. The most important verse, of course, is, has to do with the gospel, but this verse actually comes from the Old Testament. It's Proverbs 4.23, and here's what it says. Above all else, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. Above mm -hmm. all else, guard your heart. doesn't say follow your heart. It says guard your heart. And here you've got this device guarding Tony Stark's heart. If it fails, he dies. Well, Tony Stark for most of his life hasn't been guarding, and heart, guarding his heart. He's been following it, and it's, he's still miserable. Well, he goes on this long character arc where he actually becomes someone who instead of following his heart, guards his heart, he realizes what's really important in life. And at the very end of Endgame, it's Tony Stark who sacrifices himself to beat Thanos and defeat uh, the evil that's going to take out most of the population of the world, right? Tony Stark yeah. does this. A billionaire playboy arms dealer becomes a hero. Now, here's where the movie writers who didn't even know they were doing this, have put a Christian theme in. First of all, he goes from it's all about me to it's all about others. Hmm. He sacrifices himself to save the world. That sounds familiar, right? Yes. And the most in interesting thing is this. Ricky, imagine if he had gotten to the end of Endgame. He's, he's there with all his Avenger buddies. They're about to take on Thanos. And Tony Stark looks at the rest of his Avenger buddies and he goes, <sighs> You know, guys, I'm just not feeling it today. You know, I'm, I'm not really interested in taking on Thanos. You know, in fact, I got to get back to following my heart and taking care of just me. I'm out. You guys got it. 
And then the movie ended. Who, who would have said, wow, that's inspiring. Wow, that really enchanted me. That was exciting. Nobody, everybody would have said, what a terrible movie. What an mm -hmm. absolutely awful movie. Tony Stark wimped out. He didn't do anything. We'd all go, that's awful. And yet the culture tells us over and over again to be happy, we gotta follow our heart. But when we see people doing that, we go, oh, that's bad. He should have sacrificed himself to save others. So the people making these movies, even though they may be not Christians, they may be even anti-Christians, they can't help but put in an inspiring theme because mm -hmm. God has put eternity on our hearts and he's put sacrifice on our hearts as the ultimate form of love. We know that. And so even these people that aren't making Christian movies can't help, but to make it a good movie, it's got to have a, a it's got to parallel the greatest story ever told sacrifice to save others. Absolutely. Uh, you have made some really, really great connections uh, in this book. And I have really, I've really seriously been enjoying it. Um, the idea that you have, you've mixed in the themes of the movies in, in a, in such a great way to be able to communicate apologetics ideas that people really need to, to connect with. And you, you make a, a comment somewhere in the book about, you know, what would it be like if you used these cons these compelling storylines to share these truths with people? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you how do you, you feel about that working? I know some people in Christian circles, you know, you'll see the the church that's going to do the the series about you know movies uh, that are in the theaters right now. Mm -hmm. They're going to do a, a a sermon series, and some some believers think that's just it's hype. It's just it's a way to try to you know trick people into getting into the the church for an hour, um, you know, or a bait and switch kind of idea. What? How do you feel about that? You know, that being a a thing that some Christians push back against. Well, there's a lot to be said on this point. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, many sermons are very shallow today, and I agree that they ought they ought to go deeper, and they ought to really deal with the issues of the day and deal with the Bible, deal with what the Bible says, rather than trying to cater to the culture. However, we can use the culture, what's going on in the culture, to point to Jesus. And in fact, there are two people in the scriptures that did this a lot: Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul. In yes. fact, uh, let's let's talk about Paul for a second. In 51 AD, 18 years after the resurrection, Paul goes to Athens. Yes. And he's distressed with all the idols in the town and he wants to reach these people. This when is one he of my has favorite an opportunity, stories. what's that? <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories actually. Yeah. yeah, when when he has an opportunity to reach them, he doesn't quote from the Old Testament like he does when he goes into the synagogue with the Jews, right? Right. Uh, they, the Jews already agree with the Old Testament, so he's going to use the common ground. But he doesn't have that luxury with the Athenians. They don't even know what the Old Testament is. So he's not going to quote the Old Testament. He's not going to quote the, the Bible at the time. What he's going to do is quote their own philosophers. He's going to quote their own stories. He's mm -hmm. going to reference the, the, uh, the, uh, the Acropolis right behind him. The big temple to Athena, who they think dwells in the temple. Behind. He's, he's going to use all their stories to make his point. In other words, he's going to reference the movies of his day to, to use those as a bridge to what he's trying to say. You know, they had that altar to an unknown God. You know, yeah. uh, uh, Paul sees all these altars all around him. And then there's one to an unknown God. And the reason they have the one to the unknown God is because they're they're – they're covering themselves. Maybe there's a God we don't know about, and we don't want to annoy this God. So let's put an altar out there just in case we missed him. And so Paul says, I, I, I've come to tell you about this God, the altar to the unknown God, the true God, the true God who doesn't build, who doesn't, who doesn't live in temples built by human hands. Man, mm -hmm. he had a lot of guts to say that. Why? Because he's standing yes. right below the greatest temple they've ever built to a God that apparently lives in that temple, right? I mean, he's just, yes. but he's using the stories of the day to reach them. And that's what we can do. We can use the stories that people know 
whether it's Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Batman, Wonder Woman, whatever it is, we can use those stories to say, oh, oh, you like Harry Potter? You're going to love Jesus. Oh, you think Iron Man did something great at the end of Endgame? Guess what? Jesus did something even better. Oh, you thought that uh, that uh, Captain America diving on that grenade, uh, even though it was a fake grenade, he didn't know it, was a great step of heroism? Well, Jesus didn't just die for his friends. He died for his enemies, right? Hmm. Oh, you think uh, the, the, the greatest superheroes are always have all this strength? What about Frodo and Sam? They're weak. And how... Well, why? How, how do they win? They win because they know they're weak and they have to be humble and rely on people stronger than them. Well, that's what we have to do with regard to God. When I'm weak, I'm strong, right? There's so many parallels in these movies that 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 you can say, if you love these characters, you ought to, you ought to love Jesus. Absolutely. Now, you, um, you do have quite an array of different characters that mm -hmm. you talk about. And uh, one that I have some interest in is you bring up Batman. Yep. And Batman tends to be a much darker story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, almost every time. And how do you how do you bring parallels with uh, with Batman? Well, there's a number of parallels with Batman. In fact, we think Batman has the most realistic depiction of human nature uh, mm -hmm. out of all the movie franchises we look at because what is Batman doing? He's trying to stop evil in Gotham. And notice mm -hmm. that Batman, no matter how hard he tries, never really completely succeeds. Mm -hmm. There's always another evil guy to lock up. He never gets a break, right? He never like ultimately wins. Oh, I defeated the bad. No, there's always another bad guy out there he's got to go get, right? Because yep. that's human nature. Human nature is dark. It's easy to be bad. It's hard to be good. If Batman locks up the biggest criminals in Gotham, there's going to be another criminal the next night that's going to arise. Why? Because that's human nature. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're never going to create utopia here on Earth, because human nature is bent toward evil. And in until we realize that our solutions are never going to work uh, to societal malaise, we've got to point out that that people are evil. And uh, that's the first step to understanding uh, how to orient or how to create a civilized society is to recognize People are evil. In fact, that's what that's how our government was formed. The founders knew mm -hmm. that you couldn't put power in any one group of people's hands or any one person's hands. You had to separate it. That's why we have separation of powers. In fact, that's even brought up in, in Iron Man, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In Iron Man, the feds want to get a Tony Stark suits. Why? Because he could go rogue, right? He's got too much power in one in one guy. So we developed that point there. But in Batman, it's got the most realistic depiction of human nature anywhere. Also. I know a lot of people didn't like this movie, but Batman versus Superman addresses one of the one of the most difficult questions of all time, and that is if there's a good God, why is there evil? Hmm. It, it it addresses it directly, Ricky. He actually Lex Luthor in the movie says, you know, why is there a good God or or why is there evil if there's a good God? And why is Batman vi uh, fighting Superman? By the way, well here's here's the spoiler alert. Real real short depiction of the of the plot here lex luther is mad at superman because he thinks superman is the god of this world and god did not stop lex luther's own father from abusing lex luther as a child so he said superman is a bad god so he's trying to get batman to kill superman because superman is a bad god now notice and he, he states this explicitly this is you know you're a bad god and you ought not live and all this you're the problem um but notice, Ricky, that while Lex Luthor is angry that God hasn't stopped or didn't stop his father from doing evil to him, Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor is not mad at God at all for not interfering with him doing evil to other people. You notice he wants God to stop people from doing evil to him, but he doesn't want God to stop him from doing evil to other people. And this is true of all of us, isn't it? Because when we are upset with evil, we're never really upset with evil in ourselves, at least very rarely. Normally, we're upset with other people. You know, like, God, why don't you stop him? Or, God, why didn't you stop her? We never say, God, why don't you stop me? And I, I, we ask the question in the book, Hollywood Heroes. We ask the question, if God were to stop evil at, at midnight tonight, would you still be alive at 1201? And my answer is no, I wouldn't be. None of us would be because we yeah. all do evil every day. And, and the reason God doesn't stop evil is because if he, if he really wanted to stop evil, he'd have to take away our free will. 
And if he takes away our free will, then we can't love. So he gives us free will so we can love. It opens up the possibility for evil, obviously, but God can redeem evil. In fact, that's what Jesus does. He comes and he takes evil upon himself so he doesn't have to punish us for our sins. And ultimately, how does God deal with evil? He quarantines it. He puts it in a place called hell. He actually doesn't take away people's free will. He just separates them from the people who don't no longer want to be associated with evil, people that want to be with God in eternity. And so there's only two destinations in the end game. You're either going to be with God, that's heaven, or you're going to be separated from God, that's hell, because God respects free choice. He always respects free choice. Mm -hmm. That's why there's evil. It's also why there's love. And so we unpack all that in Batman. <laughs> That's that's some great stuff. Now you uh, you also do talk about Tolkien. Uh, yeah. You talk about the Lord of the Rings, and uh, I think this is an interesting. I, I love those stories. I read those books at least once a year. All of and them. And yes. Wow, you are a nerd, man. You're reading a <laughs> yeah. lot. That's I a lot yes. Of books. That's well. A lot of <laughs> I, when I say read, I I do a lot of audio books because of life. Okay, but yeah. um, but I definitely try to get through all three at, at least once a year. But um, the uh, the idea that Tolkien chooses kind of the weakest of the characters, what seems to be the weakest of the characters, to be the ones that um, that overcome that uh, that actually are the ones that succeed in the end. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that? Is, is so important and what what points do you point to in the book yeah i think uh that is where tolkien's true christian colors come out the most is because he does pick the weakest these hobbits these three-foot hobbits who would rather stay in the shire and, and eat seven meals a day and drink beer and love the land rather than trying to take a ring across enemy territory and throw it into a volcano. They'd much rather stay home. <laughs> They're not warriors. They don't have any physical strength. They're not the smartest characters out there, but they're humble enough to know that they don't have the goods on, you know, themselves to complete the task. So they have to rely on people stronger than them or wizard stronger than them, like Gandalf and Aragorn. They have to rely on them to help them get to the promised land, get to Mount Doom so they can throw the ring in the uh, in, in the volcano there and defeat the forces of, of evil. That's what they have to do. And this is true of us. We have to rely, because we are weak, on Jesus. This is why Paul says, when I'm weak, I am strong. And God is, and Satan has given me this thorn in my flesh, but that thorn in my flesh, and I've asked God to take it away from me. He won't take it away from me. Whatever that thorn was, we don't know. But mm -hmm. it actually says, my grace is sufficient for you. You have to depend on God when you're weak. I think this is one reason why Jesus said, it's difficult for a rich man to get into heaven. Why did he say that? Because when you're rich, you, you, you don't think you're weak, and you think you can get places and do things on your own. And you don't need God. It's the poor that are blessed. It's the it's the it's it's the people that know they need God that are blessed. The weak ones know they need a savior. It's the strong that think, I got this, I can handle it. So this, I think, is is where Tolkien's true uh, Christian colors come out. And in the book Hollywood Heroes, we list all of these biblical characters that are weak too, mm. uh, that parallel. Obviously, well, it's the other way around. It's Sam and Frodo that are weak that <laughs> parallel the Christian, you know, yes. the true Christian heroes. By the way, uh, I know you know this, but we'll say this for your audience. Uh, who do you think Tolkien said was the hero of the whole Lord of the Rings series? Um, well, I hope it's Sam because You're correct. that's that's yeah. who it should be. It um, I don't know that I've ever actually read him. I don't know that I've actually read a line where he said it was Sam, but it's definitely Sam. It is Sam. You're right. That's what he said. Sam. And what a beautiful picture. Sam says, I can't carry it, but I can carry you. You know, the ring he's referring yes. to. And then he carries Frodo all the way up through, literally through hell. <laughs> yes. And, and yeah. speaking of, I, I think it's, it's a bit fascinating here when everybody, you know, people will point at Frodo. Frodo destroyed the ring. Exactly. Not really. no. If you actually read the story, he kind of failed in the he end. Did. It it almost got destroyed by default, but 
Well, no, that's, you know how it, that's you know another how it got story. destroyed. <laughs> how it got destroyed was God behind the scenes. Probably. Yes. Right. Yes. That's why that's why Gandalf kept kept telling Frodo, hey, I know Gollum's a bad guy, but give him another chance. I did, you know, he said he says there's something about Gollum. We can't judge him just yet. And it turns yes. out that Gollum in his in his quest for evil to get his precious back. Right. <laughs> in, in, in his quest to get that. I know it's I got these magical uh, voices every now and then. Um, <laughs> get his precious back. He actually uh, does destroy the ring inadvertently. Yes. Meaning that his, God was working behind the scenes to keep Gollum in in the in the story. So he could own inadvertently evil. destroy the ring. His own evil destroyed right. itself. Um, mm -hmm. I yeah, I think it's a it's a fascinating point to but mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that it's uh, exactly where we were going with this earlier. Now you do bring up another another idea when you're talking about Tolkien. Uh, you talk about C.S. Lewis, and you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the true um, uh, true myth. The true myth. Yeah. Um, I, I know some of my audience will be familiar with this idea, but but talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, Tolkien, who was a Christian, was friends with Lewis, who at the time was not a Christian. Lewis went through World War I, as did Tolkien, I believe. And Lewis thought there was too much evil in the world, so there couldn't be a good God. And, of course, he realized that if he if he knew evil, he must know good. And if good exists, then God exists. He, he eventually realized that and put it in mere Christianity. But before that, Tolkien noticed that Lewis was always interested in these dying and rising pagan myths, these dying and rising gods in these mm -hmm. pagan myths that came after Christianity. And Tolkien at one point said to him, Jack, that was, they called C.S. Lewis Jack, Jack, <laughs> why are you so enthralled with these myths about dying and rising gods, but you're not enthralled when you read about the true myth in the pages of the New Testament. True myth? What do you mean by true myth? Well, Jesus actually did die and rise again. He is the true myth. This actually happened in history. All these other ones you're reading about with which you're enthralled didn't really happen. They're myths. But Jesus really happened. And then it kind of struck Lewis that that's what, you know, why would he not be interested in the Christian version of this? Mm -hmm. And is it really true? And he investigated it and realized it was really true. And as you know, C.S. Lewis became probably the best apologist or the most, the most um, accomplished and well-known apologist of the 20th century. And if it wasn't for Tolkien saying, hey, Christianity is the true myth, he never, he may have never become a Christian. Now, you also talk in the book uh, a little bit about um, Star Wars. Yep. And uh, there's, I there's find several. Your lack of faith disturbing. <laughs> I don't have a really good Darth Vader. It's hard to be James Earl Jones. But... <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, that's you got it better. You, have you, to you, you, you try have. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Yeah, that's much better. Much okay. better. I um, should have hired you. That was that. You get a round of applause for that. That was that was really good. You got a much lower base than me. Okay. Good. Ah, uh, well, I I trained as a as a, a baritone in college. So there you go. There you go. Um, but you talk a little bit about uh, you know talk a little bit about the force, and you talk a little bit about some of the characters. What are some of the the parallels that you find there in Star Wars? Wow. And, and I know a lot of people, um, some people will push back because they'll say, um, you know, well, you know, Lucas was really more thinking about Buddhism or some yeah, other faith. Yeah, we point all that out in the beginning. We point out here are the parallels and here's where they diverge from Christianity. Uh, it's not a Christian worldview to have this impersonal force we point all that out. And, you know, faith is different in, in the Star Wars series than it is in Christianity. In the Star mm -hmm. Wars series, you know, your faith does things. <laughs> you know, if you have enough faith, you can move spaceships around, that kind of thing. In, in the Christian worldview, it's, it's not faith in faith. It's faith in Jesus. It's the mm -hmm. object of your faith. In the Christian worldview, faith is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. In the Star Wars series, faith is close your eyes to the evidence and just believe. That's not Christianity, right? Mm. Christianity is trusting in what you have good evidence to believe. But with that being said, there are some parallels that are very interesting. Of course, there's the big redemption parallel, right? 
the greatest redemption of all is, of course, of Darth Vader uh, mm -hmm. by his, spoiler alert, son, Luke Skywalker. Uh, and then there's also the redemption of, of Han Solo, which we find real fun because Han Solo is the rule-bending, egotistical skeptic <laughs> who doesn't really believe in the force kid this is all mumbo jumbo it's all tr simple tricks and nonsense there's nothing yes. like having a good blaster at your side right forget this force stuff well how does how does he become a believer over the series of three or four movies he becomes a believer for two reasons it seems number one uh somebody loves him enough to try and redeem him that's luke mm -hmm. skywalker and leia who get him out of you know he's frozen in debt with Jabba the Hutt. Remember Jabba the Hutt says, Han, you disappoint me. You haven't paid. Well, Han can't pay him. Yeah, he's in debt. So he, Han Solo is frozen in debt by, by Jabba the Hutt in this carbonite thing. And then, of course, Luke has to come redeem him, and he does redeem him. And then later on, he becomes a true believer after Han Solo sees the evidence that this stuff really is true. Mm -hmm. It really does work. And later on, as you know, he 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 says, it's all true, all of it. I didn't think it was, but it is. Well, that's a parallel, of course, to what we ought to be uh, doing mm. in Christianity. We ought to be following the evidence where it leads. And typically people are redeemed in two ways. They're redeemed because someone else cared about them to try and redeem them, which is what happens in the Star Wars series. And secondly, when they look at the evidence and go, hey, this is really true. And uh, and let's then talk about the elephant in the room mm. uh, that is uh, Harry Potter. Yeah, <laughs> um, I get a lot of pushback in the Christian Nerds Unite world mm -hmm. uh, about those who, you know, really really dislike Harry Potter because of all the magic and all the wizardry and witches and all of that. But you say in the book you imply that Harry Potter's journey maybe the most parallel to Jesus of, of any of the stories that you talk about. It is. In fact, before we get to that, let me ask you a question about the people that give you pushback. And first of all, let me say, whatever parents think is appropriate for their kids, I support, okay? I, uh, I absolutely you, agree. You know, if, you, if you think the Harry Potter series isn't for your kids for whatever reason, I'll back you up 100%, okay? because you know your kid better than I do, all right? Yes. And, and parents have the right to say, hey, this is appropriate, this isn't, okay? But my question for, for the people that say this, that because Harry Potter has magic in it, that we can't watch it, do you say the same thing about Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia? Because mm -hmm. I find that Christians seem to have a double standard. Yes. They, they don't like Harry Potter, but they're fine with Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia, and guess what? All three of those series were written by Christians, mm -hmm. okay? And they all have magic in it. And by the way, the magic they have in these series is not the kind of magic generally the Bible talks about. It's not talking about uh, the occult in that sense. Right. I mean, nobody thinks that you can get on a broomstick and fly around and play this modified <laughs> soccer game that they do in the Harry Potter series, right? Yes. Nobody thinks that that's really true. It's not really true. This is made up stuff out of J.K. Rowling's mind. And it's made up out of out of Tolkien's mind, too. I mean, Gandalf is a wizard, right? Yes. And just like Harry Potter is, okay? But why do we why are we fine with Gandalf and not fine with Harry Potter? Now, if you're gonna say, okay, I'm not fine with Harry Potter, Gandalf, or Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, okay, on what grounds? Well, it's got wizardry in it. It's got all this kind of stuff in it. And, you know, I don't want my kids exposed to that. Again, that's your call. But it seems to me that, as I say, this is made up stuff. It's fantasy stuff. We don't think it's really true. J.K. Rowling doesn't think the kind of magic in her books is really true. In fact, she says the only reason I put magic in there was it because it gives kids power that they don't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. And uh she said it's not the center of the story the center of the story is that you have to live a moral life that harry potter has to be the savior by living a moral life to save his wizardry world it, the, he she says human nature is human nature whether or not you can wave a wand harry thinks so oh, if he can wave a wand he can fix everything but he can't because human nature is human nature mm -hmm. and so she says the entire series can be summed up in two bible verses which appear in the movies and of course in the books 
One is the last enemy to be destroyed is death from 1 Corinthians 15. And the mm -hmm. other Bible verse, which appears, is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. She says those two, those two Bible verses epitomize the whole series. But she said, I never wanted to talk about these uh, with the general public because I didn't want our readers to be tipped off as to where we were going with the story. You say, well, how, how could how could people be, be be tipped off? Because look at Harry Potter. He he parallels Jesus in four distinct ways. Number one, he's prophesied to be the savior of his world before he's born. And the evil Satan figure tries to have him killed as an infant. Gee, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Secondly, Harry Potter has to live a moral life to be that savior. Thirdly, he sacrifices himself to defeat the Satan figure, Voldemort, uh, in the Harry Potter series. And then finally, number four, he rises from the dead and his followers have to put their faith in him to ultimately defeat Voldemort. Does this sound at all familiar? <laughs> yes, absolutely. This, the parallels are striking. She is basically borrowing the biblical story, turning it into a fantasy, and sold billions, well, not billions, but millions and millions of books, made billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And she's saying this parallels the biblical story. She says these are very British books. You're going to find you're going to find Bible verses in them. Uh, so again, it's up to parents whether they want their kids to watch this. But it seems to me, even if you don't want your kids to watch this, what you ought to at least inform them of is the basic storyline. So the friends of your kids who have watched it, your kid can then talk about Harry Potter and say, oh, you liked Harry Potter? Guess what? You're going to love Jesus because everything Harry Potter does, Jesus does in a more perfect way. Hmm. That's great. Well, uh, Hollywood Heroes um, kind of makes the case that the ultimate hero uh, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And what's one thing that you think all the heroes that you write about in Hollywood heroes kind of have in common with Jesus? Yeah, the one thing that all of these heroes have in common with Jesus is they all sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They all sacrifice to defeat evil and save people. But they never go as far as Jesus because nobody goes as far as Jesus. Whereas Iron Man may sacrifice himself to save the universe or save uh, his loved ones, Captain America might do that as well. Uh, other heroes will sacrifice themselves. Only Jesus sacrifices himself for his enemies. Whereas these people will sacrifice for their friends and maybe uh, their country. Jesus will sacrifice himself for his enemies. And of course he says, there's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. Jesus not only lays down his life for his friends, he lays down his life for his enemies. So that's the biggest parallel, is that they all sacrifice. Uh, and that's what makes it inspiring. As I said earlier, if they didn't sacrifice, if they were just following their heart, trying to do what was ever, what is ever expedient for themselves and whatever would, would give them the latest buzz, it wouldn't be inspiring at all. Is there something that in these stories that you wrote about, is there something that you think is unique about Jesus that these stories don't quite get right? Oh, well, yeah, there's no one in history uh, or in fiction that parallels Jesus. In fact, here's the, the last chapter of the book, Hollywood Heroes, is called The Ultimate Hero. Let me just read just the intro to this, because I think it'll it'll kind of summarize what the book is about and where we go with it. Uh, Here's, here's how we start the chapter out. If you were making up your own superhero, what kind of qualities would your hero have? Imagine you could create someone who had Captain America's righteous idealism, Iron Man's Jesus, Harry Potter's willingness to sacrifice, Luke Skywalker's discipline, Sam's loyalty, Frodo's humility, Aragorn's courage, Gandalf's wisdom, Batman's focus, Superman's power, Wonder Woman's love. You would have Jesus, right? Actually, you'd have someone closer to Jesus than any of these heroes individually, but you would still be a long way from the real Jesus. The person of Jesus is unique in all of history and literature. No one rivals him. There are commonalities, as we have seen here in the book, but there is no perfect match because there is no one with the perfect credentials of Jesus. 
And what we point out in here, Ricky, we have a number of reasons why Jesus is unique, but one of the ones that's most striking to me is that Jesus has qualities which normally you can't have uh, in one person. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, he is supremely holy, but he's also approachable. He is uh, full of truth, but also grace. He's full of grace, but also justice, right? Mm -hmm. he's, he's, um, he's completely mission-focused, but he's also people-oriented. He, he's also loving to people as well. He's not just about getting the task done. Mm -hmm. He's also about loving people. He is uh, com supremely confident, but at the same time, he's humble. He's strong, but he's also tender. How do you get these qualities at 100% capacity in one person? I don't know anybody that holds all of those qualities at 100% capacity at the same time. Maybe one or two of them, but not all of them. Mm. And anybody that tried to create a character, a perfect character like Jesus, if they tried to create him, he would be inauthentic. Whereas Jesus is the most authentic character you'll ever read about, and you know that he's unique. In fact, the ultimate hero uh, in superhero in the superhero world is probably Superman, right? And what is the knock on Superman when it comes to him being a character? Well, you know, he, he's kind of boring, yeah. right? He he's there's no there's not really any dimension to him, and and the writers really had a hard time making him an interesting character. But Jesus isn't boring. Jesus is always intriguing. He's always inspiring. He's always sort of coming up with counterintuitive ideas, and you go, "Wow, I wouldn't have thought of that." Right? Or uh, so Jesus is the is the unique character in all of fiction. In fact, we write in the book in all of fiction or nonfiction, I should say. This is obviously a nonfiction character, Jesus. We say that if Jesus had never lived no one would have been able to invent him. And mm. so here he is, a character that couldn't have been created by fishermen in the first century. They're just reporting on what they saw him say and do. And when you look at Jesus, you, you figure out, this: how did this guy become the most influential human being in history unless he rose from the dead? Mm. I mean, he never... I don't know if you've ever heard the uh, the little sermon that was done years ago. It's very short. Uh, it's called One Solitary Life. Let me just read it. It's re we have it in the book, Hollywood Heroes. It says this. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant. He grew up in another village where he worked as a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held office. He never had a family or owned a home. He didn't go to college, never he never lived in a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies, and he went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Twenty centuries have come and gone, and today he's the central figure of the human race. I am well within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on this earth as much as that one solitary life. Mm, and wow. I can't see how that could have happened unless he rose from the dead as well. And so we also have evidence in the book for the resurrection. And that is not only just evidence for the resurrection, evidence for God, evidence for the Bible being true. That's all in the book, Hollywood Heroes. So it's kind of a fun way of getting the apologetics and the biblical life lessons, you know, without giving a lecture to somebody. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, in Hollywood Heroes, if there's one thing that you want the reader to walk away with, what is it? The one thing I want the reader to walk away with is the fact that all the movies you love, 
these superhero and fantasy movies are patterned after the greatest story ever told, the true story of Jesus. And if you love any of these characters, if you just like any of these characters, you ought to love Jesus because these stories that you love are patterned after the truth, patterned after the one that did come and sacrifice himself for you and will take you to a place of bliss if you want to be taken there. If you don't, God's not going to force anyone into heaven against their will. I mean, if you don't want God now, you're not going to want him in eternity. So he will give you your wish and separate himself from you. But if you want to be with him, then just accept the free gift that he's provided you. Just trust in him. Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that he's, God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. That's great word. And I hope people do walk away from, uh, walk away with, from this book with that in mind. Um, Frank, it has been a joy having you on the show today. Um, tell everybody how they can connect with you. How, oh, how yeah, can they sure. keep up with what's going on in the, the life of Frank Turek and uh, Cross-Examined? Yeah, well, the two places you can go is crossexamined.org. That's crossexamined with a D on the end of it, .org. And then download our app, two words in the app store, Cross-Examined. We have a podcast every week called I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. It's only 48 minutes, and we cover evidence for the faith. We cross-examine arguments against it. We cover some of the uh, issues of the day as well. Uh, we have a TV show on direct TV on it's, it's streamed on our podcast as well. I should say on our, on our, our app as well. It's streamed on our website, crossexamine.org. We also go to a lot of colleges, high schools, and churches, and we present evidence that Christianity is true uh, from our book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And also now from Hollywood heroes. So, uh, just check us out at crossexamined.org. Download the app uh, and uh, also take a look at our podcast. That's new material that we put out every week. Awesome. Frank, it has been a joy having you on the show. Thank you so much for being willing to come on. Hey, Ricky, one other thing I do want to say, I think the book Hollywood Heroes is written in a way that parents, if you want to get your kids more interested in God, more interested in Christianity, pick up a copy, uh, do movie night, right? Read the chapter before you watch the movie. And then there yes. are five discussion questions at the end of each chapter that you can uh, have with your, with your kid or youth pastors or even pastors. You can use all this uh, to communicate the truth in a fun way, a way that people are already interested, already interested in learning. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the beauty of using uh, the culture in a good way. Are they already interested in this stuff? Okay. Let's show you how it points to the, the greatest story ever told the story that ought to impact your life forever. Awesome. That that's definitely something I I really did enjoy in the book. Um when I uh, I was I I first heard about the book, I thought this pop culture book seems a little out of character for uh for you and your mm -hmm. your uh your organization. Mm -hmm. And then once I started reading the book, seeing how much apologetics you worked mm -hmm. into the story, mm -hmm. into the book, I was like, oh, this makes so much more sense now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and it, 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 it really does bring the two together so well. Um, you know, yeah, that, that, that idea of doing pop culture and apologetics at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It re honestly really has been a brilliant read. I am really enjoying it. Well, thanks, Ricky. Thanks for getting it out too on your podcast and social media, wherever you can. We appreciate that. We just want more people to know about it. And Absolutely. Yeah, it's, true. it's true. There's a lot of garbage that comes out of Hollywood, but when they put out good stuff, we ought to use it for the gospel. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'll put links down below in the show notes so right. that if you're watching, you can just click on those links and be able to uh, connect with Frank and his organization. Anything else you want to share before we go? No, sir. I sure appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Ricky. Nerds unite. Let's do it. All right. Blessings. <laughs> Good show, man. <laughs> It was great getting to know Dr. Frank Turek and hearing his take on some of our most beloved heroes. If you'd like to know more about Frank or his ministry, I've put links down in the show notes and as well as links to purchase his most recent books. 
I also hope you will check out the bonus episodes that we are releasing on Fridays periodically over the summer. I'm joined by the hosts of The Reverend and the Reprobate, Lucas Pinkard and Dan Gibson, the host of Fangirling Over Jesus, Ashley Cox, the host of the Speaking Nerdy podcast, Mike Schilling, and the great BB Nate from Tatooine Sons podcast as we do an actual play of the Marvel Multiverse role-playing game playtest. Check out the bonus episodes and each of their podcasts for lots of fun and inspiration. Uh, well, that's all I have for you today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, click. Just click all those links down there, whatever they happen to be, and uh, that way you will be informed every time we put out new content. And you can find all of our social links, links to our YouTube channel, and our online store at ChristianNerdsUnite.com. I do want to take a moment to encourage you to join us as a supporter on Patreon. We've changed all of our Patreon levels, and every level has great benefits and makes a huge difference in the ministry we're able to do, and it starts as low as $5 per month. Supporters will also get to hear exclusive stories of believers we are serving around the world through our ministry partners. To check it out or to partner with us, go to patreon.com slash christiannerdsunite or christiannerdsunite.com and click on the support menu. And while I'm at it, I do want to thank our current Patreon supporters, Sim, Peter, Joe, Jared, Ryan, and our newest supporters, Jake, Dave, and John. Thanks so much for your support. You really are making a difference. Before I go, I do want to leave you with this blessing from Ephesians 3. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. We'll see you next week. Blessings. <music>